Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Blog. This one is titled, Why Mental Illness is a Myth. Why Mental Illness is a Myth. Now, some of you may be attempted to diagnose me with a mental illness or for being slightly deranged just by suggesting that something as obviously true and well-established conventionally as the notion of mental illness may indeed be a myth. Clearly, I have to be out of touch with reality, out of touch with scientific findings, and have to have been more or essentially, you know, hiding under a rock to make such a claim. But the truth is, mental illness is a myth. And in this vlog, I'm going to lay out for you exactly why it is a myth. And I'm going to make a very, very compelling case for why that is so and why it really matters, not just for you individually, but for all of us um, collectively. And especially if you, if you struggle in your life or if you work as a therapist, getting this simple, getting the fact that mental illness is a myth will truly, truly make a difference. So, first of all, how, how can I make this claim? Well, when I first started seeing clients 22 years ago, here in Norway, I would take on any commerce with a no change, no pay policy, <clears throat> and I would very often get in people who had not succeeded in traditional forms of therapy. And uh, psychiatry is very well established here in Norway, and, and a solid percentage of these clients would say that they had a mental illness, that they were sick, that depression was, was a disease of the brain, it was a chemical imbalance of the brain, uh, and, and that it was a, a disease, just like uh, diabetes might be a disease, or, or, or just like cancer may be a disease. And this seemed to be the, the common thing. People would say that, you know, they're, I, I'm sick, I'm mentally ill, I, I have a chemical imbalance, I'm, I'm on these drugs to, to, to correct for this chemical imbalance. And I, I started getting curious and I, I would ask people, you know, uh, I have no doubt that you're suffering, that you're having unwanted experiences, whether they are thoughts or feelings or, or behaviors that you're, that you're engaging in. But, but how do you know that you're sick? How do you know that this actually constitutes a, a disease in, in the medical sense? And people would say, well, my, my doctor or my psychiatrist or my psychologist told me so. It's, it's, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. I would say, okay, I, I get that they told you so, but where's the evidence? I mean, if you, if you get diagnosed with cancer, uh, there, there's, there's a host. I mean, of course, there's going to be conversation and an interview, but there's going to be medical tests to confirm or disconfirm the evidence of cell pathology. You know, if, if you have diabetes, this would often be the two examples that people would mention, cancer and diabetes. If you have diabetes, there, there, there's a, a, you know, tests, blood work, so on and so forth, that you do to, um, to, to verify or falsify the idea that you have diabetes. So where is the test for the chemical imbalance in the brain? And after having seen clients professionally for 22 years, I have still to meet any client who has ever had a test that could verify or falsify the claim that there's something chemically wrong with their brain, that they have a so-called chemical imbalance. Isn't it just a little bit interesting how say no one currently would 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 accept a diagnosis of cancer or diabetes without extensive medical testing but people are very happy to accept the idea that there's something wrong with their brain or something chemically wrong with their brain without any test whatsoever to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis now the truth is that there is no test 
uh, in the world today that clients or patients, patients I should say, uh, can go through that that uh, you know confirms or disconfirms as such a hypothesis. Um, so the diagnosis itself is is not based upon science. There, there, there's no scientific basis behind any of this. Now it's really important to look at what differentiate a differentiates a medical diagnosis from a psychiatric diagnosis. You know, a lot of people have never thought to ask themselves that question. Now, for the most part, you know, a legitimate medical diagnosis has been discovered, meaning you can do various sorts of objective testing to show to, to confirm or disconfirm, you know, a tumor or, or, you know, some sort of cell pathology, some sort of infection. Um, all the psychiatric diagnoses, on the other hand, have been invented. They've been constructed. They come into being by psychiatrists coming together and voting. I'm, I'm not kidding you. The, this is the truth. They, they come together and they vote over which clusters of behaviors and ways of thinking that they should group together and label as diseases and then sell as brain diseases or mental illnesses. So, for example, Back in the day, there, there were two, in early psychiatry, there, there were two Negro diagnoses. So one of them was called dropotomania. And uh, if you were a black person and, and, and you had this crazy idea at the time that you were entitled to live life as a free man or free woman, uh, you could get the diagnosis of dropotomania. Trape, which would be uh, like, like, like a wild, you know, run or escape and, and mania. Meaning, if you were suffering under such delusions, that clearly showed that you had not understood your place and role in society as a black person. So that was the basis for the diagnosis. Um, up until very recently, you know, the I think it was 1974. If you were homosexual, that was diagnosed as a serious psychiatric illness. But, but then, of course, the, the norms of society changed. The values of society changed in the Western world. Christianity you know, lost more and more of its you know, grip. Uh, so they voted psychiatrists got together and they voted and, and and now they voted that that this was a sexual orientation so overnight homosexuality went from a serious psychiatric disease to a sexual orientation now the interesting part here was that there was no medical evidence in in which uh, homosexuality was deemed to be a disease to begin with and there was no medical evidence that rested as the foundation of, of homosexuality becoming uh, a sexual orientation. It's just that the norms of society and the powers to be changed. And therefore, what was a disease and what was not a disease uh, changed. Somewhat ironically, if you were a white supremacist or, or, or you know, racist or, a, uh, you know, a Nazi or something like that, and, and, and you, you know, championed that, that black people, in fact, should be slaves and that, that that was their proper, you know, role in society, today, that could easily land you a psychiatric diagnosis. <clears throat> or if, if, if you were to... to uh, make certain claims about homosexuality, you know, to, to, today you would be the one who, who would be more likely to, to end up with a psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Think about that. So, for example, 
in, in the last edition of, of the DSM, DSM-5, rapism was about to get voted in to become a disease, the, the, the so-called disease of rapism. You know, you, you have people who, who commit multiple rapes. Um, but then a lot of protests came in, you know, from the more feminist branches, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, being concerned that if rapism became a disease, then the rapists might get more lenient punishments and, and get all sorts of benefits and advantages that very often come with a diag di diagnosis, you know, in the legal system. So, as a result of those protests, it, it was not voted in to become a disease. Now, let me ask you this. Is, is a profession that operates like this a scientific endeavor? Does, does this reek of scientific credibility or, or, or a field that really deserves credibility or, or that deserves or trust? Because if, if you start looking at this, you start to realize that a lot of psychiatry diagnoses disagreement as disease. I'll say that again. A lot of psychiatry diagnoses disagreement as disease. In my mind, that, that, that's a huge ethical flaw. It's just really, really bad ethics. So a, a lot of this is uh, state-sanctioned, social control, masquerading as medicine. If you doubt that, take a look at diagnoses such as oppositional defiant disorder and look at the criteria for it and ask yourself, what the hell does this have to do with medicine? How, how is this a disease? Where's the proof? Where's the evidence? How is this not diagnosing disagreement as disease? The, the, the huge, so very, you know, the, the, the huge intellectual dishonesty and discrepancy in how psychiatry portrays itself to the public is that they market metaphorical diagnosis as literal medical diagnosis, and they don't bother to make the distinction. In actuality, they do everything they can to blur the distinction. So one of my favorite examples of this comes from the late psychiatrist Thomas Soss, who, in my opinion, was the great thinker and, and the foremost critic of, of psychiatry in the world for over 50 years. He, he um, in, in differentiating between a, a metaphorical diagnosis and a, a literal diagnosis, he would say, imagine <clears throat> going into a bar and ordering a screwdriver. The bartender is not going to throw a working tool back at you. Like both you and the bartender know that that's the last thing that you're asking for. What you're going to get is, I'm not a bartender, I hardly drink, so, but you're, you're going get, to get a drink that's some combination of vodka and orange juice and, and some other stuff. So screwdriver is a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Now, in, in the realm of diagnosis, the fact that you have a psychiatric diagnosis means that there's no evidence that there's anything wrong with your brain. It means the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that a psychiatric diagnosis means that there's something wrong with your brain. There may be, but, but the psychiatric diagnosis per definition means that th there's no evidence of such being the case, meaning you haven't gone through neurological tests that have shown some sort of pathology or, or some pathology hasn't been discovered. So hear me clearly, I'm not saying 
that there may not be something wrong in the brains of some people who have psychiatric diagnosis. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the psychiatric diagnosis in and of itself shows that there is no evidence of such a thing. Because if there was, you wouldn't be having a psychiatric diagnosis. You would be having a neurological diagnosis. You'd be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or um, a brain tumor, actual brain diseases based upon there, there being the discovery of brain pathology based upon actual testing, right? In that case, you wouldn't be having a psychiatric diagnosis and you probably wouldn't be seeing a psychiatrist either. This is kind of a crucial point to get. So, so William Glasser, a late psychiatrist who also rejected the whole notion of, of mental illness, he, he had an analogy for this that I, I kind of modified a little bit because he, he kind of presupposes a mind-body split that I'm not quite comfortable with. But, but, but he said, look at how you know physical disease is diagnosed based upon uh, and I don't like this because it, it kind of presupposes that what we call psychological factors has nothing to do with what happens in your body. And it, I, I know he didn't claim that, but 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 the analogy could could kind of get uh, heard that way. So so he said, look, if if you go to your medical doctor with, with some sort of physical complaint, and the medical doctor runs all sorts of tests and then they come came, come back negative, you're 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 not in most cases going to be given a, a diagnosis of being sick and the claim that there's something wrong with you if, if there's no evidence that, that there's anything wrong with you. Rather, you're, you're well, you'll probably get pushed drugs <laughs> anyways in many cases, but if it's like a, a, a according to my standards, an, an, eth an ethical doctor you know, he, he may encourage you to, to improve your health, you know, whether it's getting better sleep or improving the, your, your diet, you know, or exercising more, or looking into your relationships or reducing your stress levels, you know, these sorts of things. But if you go to a, uh, a medical doctor and, and you're, you're, you're unhappy, you know, you're, you're really unhappy and you, you, you may have you know, some, some crazy thinking going on and you may have some irrational fears or, you know, you, you, you may, you know, have lost uh, appetite or interest in doing the stuff that you usually do and you feel down most of the time. Uh, th 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 there likely is no medical tests, but you'll still get a diagnosis as if there was one and you'll be told that there's something wrong with your brain and you'll, you'll, you'll get pushed, you know, antidepressants or antipsychotics or, or tranquilizers or, or, or something like that. Um, this is, this is problematic. So pushing a, a metaphorical diagnosis as if it was a literal diagnosis is, is not good ethics. It's very shady marketing at best. Now, a, a group of people, psychiatrists, an entire profession who does this decade after decade after decade, so you, you have to ask, are they collectively unable to grasp such distinctions? Like, like don't, don't they have the, the perspective taking uh, collectively to, to make a distinction between the metaphorical diagnosis and a literal diagnosis? Or, you know, or are they able to make such distinctions, but they, they, they deliberately uh, do it anyway in an attempt to medicalize human suffering. You gotta, you gotta realize this, this, this whole push of mental illness and treating mental illness and, and how you know, human suffering, you know, became so medicalized. It's been going on for a long time, but, but, but it really, really skyrocketed with the release of the DSM-3 in 1980. In the 70s, psychiatrists as a profession were struggling. 
You know, you, you, you had movies such as One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you know, and uh, you, you had the Rosenhan experiments in, in the States that really put some egg on the face of psychiatry. Uh, you had books like Thomas Saw's The Myth of Mental Illness and, and other books that was released in 1961. But, but, but there, there was the, the culture was kind of coming around to the idea that the psychiatry is kind of shady. You know, you, you, you had the, the, the horrific conditions of, of mental institutions. Uh, you, you had uh, insurance companies, you know, being kind of dubious in terms of paying for psychiatric treatment, where they would go, hey, there's social workers, there's, there's psychologists, there's religious services. Um, what makes what you do different? So, and psychiatrists too, we're kind of like on the lower end of the, the, the status hierarchy in, in medicine. You know, they, they were kind of a, uh, the redheaded stepchild of the profession. So what, what they decided to do was they, they, they decided in the moment of crisis to really reestablish their identities as physicians, as medical doctors. And in a very successful marketing campaign in, in accordance with the, the, the big pharmaceutical companies, you know, of course, they, 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 there's no brain pathology that's been found in, in, in any of these psychiatric conditions. So, so they, they really started to promote the idea of chemical imbalances in the brain based on zero evidence. But they, they sold the story and... and we got a lot more diagnosis as well, meaning a lot more of, of like the human predicament was was medicalized because if you no longer restrict yourself to medical testing, but you can just use metaphorical diagnosis, there's no limit to what you can diagnose as a disease. And, and by, by, by branding it all as, as medical issues, you know, they were able to take over the markets because the, the, these are medical issues to be treated, you know, by us. And as a result, they've gained an, an enormous influence uh, in, in the educational systems, you know, in prison systems, you know, how we look at conflict, how, how we look at what it is to be a human being. But ask yourself, is the Western world where psychiatry dominates, is it a healthier place? I mean, if, if these folks really had solutions, are people happier today? Do they have better relationships? Like you, you, you'd have to, I think you'd have to do a lot of mental acrobatics to claim that the, these diagnoses and these drugs have made the world a better place, that, that people are mentally healthier today than they were in 1980. I, I think you'd really, really, really have to have to do a lot of mental acrobatics to, to be doing that. But it's extremely profitable, you know, not, not, not only that, uh, but from an identity standpoint, you know, it, it reinforced the identity of the medical, prof you know, psychiatrists as true medical professionals who, who were treating uh, actual diseases. Now, you, you may object and you, you may say, well, you know, but, but hey, Jurgen, uh, the fact that people behave in deviant ways or, or have thinking that, you know, most people would consider crazy. Well, that's evidence that there's something wrong with someone's brain. Well, there may be, but it's hardly evidence. Think about this. When Germany went from being a relatively civilized society, you know, in the late 20s and early 30s, into the, the, the Nazi hellhole that it became in, in you know, the mid 30s, well, the 30s and, and the 40s. Um, the atrocities, the, the, the persecution of Jews, the, the crazy thinking of German national socialism, the, the enormous support uh, in the population. Did 
Did Germans suddenly collectively suffer from a chemical imbalance in the brain? Did they suddenly suffer from some genetic defect? If, if you were one of the protesters in Germany during that time, you would be the one with the psychiatric diagnosis. You would be the crazy one. Think about that. Or if you go to 1994, Rwanda, you know, the, 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 the turf battle uh, between the Hutsis and, and, and the Tutsis, I can't remember who killed who, but like close to a million people were slaughtered with uh, machetes in like the course of, I think, like six weeks or something. Did, did all those people suddenly collectively have a chemical imbalance in the brain? Is... I mean, it's, it's heinous behaviors. It's, it's, it's stupid thinking, right? But is, is that in of itself evidence that, that there was suddenly something wrong with their brains? That, you know, six weeks previously, they were for the most part normal, and then six weeks later, they were okay again, and, and then there was this chemical imbalance in the brain in the meantime? What's going on there? Notice when I when I previously talked about uh, psychiatry being um, state appoint, state appointed means of social control masquerading as medicine. Sounds like a crazy conspiracy theorist, you know. <laughs> sounds like I'm unreasonable in my claims, but whether you get whether you get diagnosed as crazy or not largely depends upon the culture you live in and whether, you know, how many people who agree with your, your thinking and, and are there powerful organizations to back you. So another Thomas Sauce example, you know, he used to say that uh, if you went to church and you prayed to God, you know, you're a good Christian. If God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. So if a bunch of people get together collectively and they hallucinate the God and, and they pray to him, they're, they're good Christians. You can talk about, you know, the virgin births, you know, Jesus standing up from the dead. You know, you, you, you can talk about things that to me sound completely crazy. And not only will you not be called crazy, you, you can socially demand respect for your beliefs. But if you were to suddenly say in a business meeting, you know, you know, God tells me not to disclose that to you and you were serious, it's not socially acceptable. Now you're suddenly in trouble. And God is supposed to be the omnipotent one, meaning you can talk to him, but he can't talk to you. Like, what, what, what's that all about, right? Or you could, you could claim that the most marvelous human being to ever walk the earth was a warlord who had sex with children. It was a pedophile. His name was Muhammad. You could, you, you could claim that this is human perfection. And you could, you could take a holy book that's that's full of of uh, promoting violence, you know. And you could you you could call it a religion of peace. And these you know, 1.3 billion people support this. In my mind, madness. Now, granted, people interpret these texts very differently. There are more or less plausible interpretation of the texts. But, but you could you could claim that homosexuals should be you know stoned and that apostates should be put to death and you know that that uh, uh, non-believers uh, should should pay a special tax uh, you, you could claim all these things and you, you can demand respect for it but in today's current climate for example for me when I make these claims this is no longer socially acceptable. We don't really have freedom of speech anymore. So now, now I could easily be labeled as, this is hate speech. This is a crime. 
Jurgen suffers from Islamophobia. Now, notice how that term gets thrown around, Islamophobia. It means that any critique of a set of ideas, of an ideology, is evidence that there has to be something irrational and sick in my thinking. Why isn't there a capitalistophobia or uh, Buddhistophobia or even Christophobia? Why is there currently in this politically correct climate only one set of ideas that you can't critique? If you critique it, uh, you're suddenly an Islamophobic. Norwegian, you know, uh, the Norwegian state at the moment is planning uh, uh, how, how to combat Islamophobia, right? As if this is, uh, this is something legitimate. So, what, you know, what about, so for example, if, if, if believing in, in strange things, so for example, when I grew up in, in Norwegian public school, we learned a little bit about the atrocities of German National Socialism and, and, and the Nazis. I learned nothing about communism. I learned nothing about the horrors and the atrocities that the communist ideology has led to place after place, time after time. What about, now the reason for that, of course, is, is that a lot of the teachers in Norwegian public school are closet communists. You know, they, they, they kind of support the ideas. So they're, they're not gonna criticize them. But what about people, what about people who, who support that ideology, who, who just won't, in my opinion, reality test? And, and, and look at the consequences of, of that ideology. Why is that not a mental illness? Why is not believing that a warlord who was a pedophile, being the most awesome human being ever, why is that not a mental illness? But why is distrusting authority and asking too many questions the mental illness of oppositional defiant disorder? Think about it really, really think about it. Now, some people will make the claim that, uh, well, the fact that these drugs work, that's evidence of chemical imbalance in the brain. Well, I, I have news for you. You know, e even in, in diagnosis such as schizophrenia, which is kind of the sacred symbol of psychiatry, even though there's hardly any agreement what it really is, uh, third world countries, have way higher success rates than first world countries, like way higher, where, where they don't use the drugs and they don't, they don't do this stuff. Even the World Health Organization has admitted this. The, the truth about uh, psychiatric drugs currently, the, 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 the meta test, you know, meta tests are back, uh, none of them, none of them have evidence that people using them long-term are better off than people not using them. None of them. It's something to contemplate. Probably didn't know that. Why didn't you know that? Why isn't that first page news in your, main, in, in your mainstream media? How, how could that be? Isn't that just a tad interesting? Now, this is this is fuzzy logic because it's a bit like let's say that you were a, a guy or a girl and you were out at a bar and you fancied someone and you, you were too anxious to go up and introduce yourself so you had a couple of beers and a couple of shots and now you have the courage to do it so, so okay great uh, is is that evidence that the shots and the beer corrected a chemical imbalance in your brain that made you unable to, to move? Was it lack of beer that, you know, is this? So what you could, you know, it would be way more honest, you know, with drugs. So let's say someone's unhappy and they go to a psychiatrist. In, in, instead of marketing this, this idea of a chemical imbalance in the brain, if someone's not 
psychologically oriented, for example, and they insist upon a pharmacological solution to life's... Some people prefer that. Okay. You could, you, you could, well, there's not much evidence that these drugs actually help people, you know, but in, in, instead of selling this disease model, you could say, okay, you know, you feel A, B, and C. That's your experience. You, you'd prefer not to experience that. If I give you these drugs, you know, you will likely, well, you'll likely feel less sad. You, you'll feel less down. You, you, you'll feel less happiness as well. You know, you, you may be impotent for a while. You may gain some weight, but you may sleep better. You know, like, like you could, you could like make your case that th these are common effects of the drug. And then you could say, would you prefer that? And the person could go, yeah, I like a pharmacological solution. I would prefer that. That at least would be more intellectually honest versus selling this idea that it's it's a so-called chemical imbalance in the brain. Look, look, look at something else as well. You know, these diagnoses to, to a large extent function as a form of social stigmatization, meaning when is the last time you heard about the diabetic serial rapist, you know, or uh, the the migraine headache suffering serial killer uh, or burglar or uh, gunman or whatever it might be? You haven't, but you may have heard about the schizophrenic one or or or, or the bipolar one. So. These are these are tools of, of social stigmatization. I mean, in any society, whistleblowers, dissenters, um, people who, who, who challenge the powers that be, psychiatry is an excellent tool for the state to, to, to get around these pesky issues of free speech and human rights, because as, as soon as you can deem someone as, as uh, uh, psychiatrically ill, you know, you, you, you can strip them of, of, of their platform. You, 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 can, you can socially stigmatize them in such a way that most people will never, ever take them seriously again. It's a, um, it's a, it's a wonderful tool for power. The, these abuses happen way more often than you may suspect. It's the psychiatric practices, you know, the, the involuntary part of it is, is certainly incompatible with with uh, basic ideas such as free speech and and, uh, and uh, human rights. Um, there, there's there's something to think about here because this this idea that if someone acts crazy or, or, or does deviant things, you know, that has to be something wrong with their brain. Well, let's take a little detour. Most people believe <clears throat> that pain, physical pain, always is a signal that something is wrong in the body. We, we've, we've been sold this, this idea. And it's, it's sometimes true. Meaning sometimes when people hurt in their stomach or hurt in their head or, or, or hurt in their back, you know, there, there may be something wrong some of the time. But most of the time when people have pain, there is actually nothing wrong. Or the pathology is not actually correlated with the pain. There's, there's quite a few studies that have shown that two-thirds of people without chronic pain, you know, in their backs have pretty, you know, strong so-called structural abnormalities. So if you, if you go to a back doctor, for example, and you, you know, and, and he, you complain about certain pains, and then he sends you for some MRIs, and the tests come back, and you might say, you know, you, you have these structural abnormalities here and there, and that's creating that pain. You know, look here, L4, L5, sounds really impressive. But what most people don't know is barring, you know, cancer, infection, broken bones, stuff like that, if you just give the pictures to a back doctor, uh, without telling them anything about the patient. They're just throwing darts in the dark. Like there's a lot of people who have a lot of so-called structural abnormalities in the back. They have no pain. 
And then you have other people with very little, and they're, they're like crippled with pain. And then you have a bunch of people who, who have pain in the wrong places, you know, not the places where they're supposed to have them. All, a, a, a normal brain, whatever that would be, can easily generate chronic pain. All it would have to do is to reduce the amount of blood flow to, a, to an area so that you suffer from mild oxygen deprivation that hurts like a bitch. A brain can do that. So, if you can hear voices, if you can hear me speak, if you can see stuff, if you can feel stuff, a healthy, you know, a, a normal brain can easily produce a hallucination, can easily hear voices or see things that aren't there based upon conventional reality, or, or use creativity to create all sorts of hallucinations and, and delusions. This is child play for a brain. Anyone who has experience with hypnosis and hypnotic phenomena has seen whatever a normal brain is do all sorts of fancy stuff. This is in and of itself not evidence of brain pathology. It's just sloppy thinking. Now, it is, of course, true that when, when brains are damaged, you know, people very often end up behaving weirdly. That is often true. But it's not always true. You have, you know, quite a few people who have had, you know, glimpses of what we in meditation called awakenings or enlightenment experiences have likely had a stroke. You, you, you can read Jill Bolta Taylor's book, you know, My Stroke of Insight, to, to, to get some wonderful descriptions of this. Uh, you, you also have examples of people who have been knocked unconscious. And then afterwards, they discover that they have some amazing abilities that are positive. I recently saw on YouTube, there's this clip you can look up with the American TV uh, talk show host, Megan Kelly. And there's this guy who was knocked unconscious. And, and after that, he became like a, a math genius. Like the, the blow to his brain, you know, uh, shook up some circuits. And, and, and after that, he's been able to do like amazing feats of mathematics. And this guy had no skills at mathematics and no talents for mathematics, as far as we know. Of course, he had the talents since his brain is doing it, but he, he was not skilled at mathematics. He, he, he had never shown any particular talent or skill or interest in mathematics. So brain injuries can lead to all sorts of weird and bizarre um, bizarre phenomena, you know. So, so uh, consider this, consider this. From a very pragmatic perspective, uh, one of the most useful things that I have done with many of my clients have been to educate them on this very topic. This speech that I just kind of gave you, to, 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 to help them make those distinctions and think about it and, and, and to realize that there's no evidence that there's anything wrong with them. That alone has radically changed the lives of many, 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 many people. I mean, if someone's going to help you and if a profession is going to help you and they, A, diagnose you with diseases you don't actually have, tell you that you have a broken brain absent any evidence and then give you dangerous brain drugs and kind of imply that there's very little you can do to to kind of help yourself is that good ethics is that driven by compassion is is that skilled is that wise so consider this i i i know that that this idea of mental illness has it's been taken for granted in our society for so long that you, you sound like a complete heretic by, by even questioning it. But, but I would urge you to look at the evidence. Read up on Thomas Sauce. Read the triology of the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, Robert Whitaker, Mad in America, uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic, Psychiatry Under the Influence. If, if this idea of chemical imbalances in the brain has convinced you, Read Joanna Moncrief's The Myth of the Chemical Cure. 
or Irving Kirsch, the Emperor's New Drugs, which really pulls the curtain, you know, on on the the antidepressants. You know, educate yourself. If you're working in the profession of seeing clients, you should know the history of psych psychiatry. You you, sh you should you should know these things. You, you you should know the framework and be be able and willing to challenge the frameworks that that the, the collective ideas arise out of. So hope this provoke the hell out of you and may get you thinking a little bit. Till next time.